All right, everybody, this uh, video covers rocket propulsion, obviously, as the slide tells you, it's 2.2.4 uh, modified in the Mr. T way. So this won't exactly match what you would download from my PLTW. Uh, it's pretty close. I think it's a little bit more uh, explanatory. So it's going to cover uh, some equations and some concepts that we're going to use, that you're going to use, to uh, design and build your own rocket. Uh, so just to recall, we're still on the topic of propulsion. We've talked a little bit about propellers. So remember, propeller is just a rotating wing that instead of lift, when you turn it 90 degrees, it creates thrust. Uh, we know all about turbines. We've talked a little bit about ramjets. And uh, if you don't remember, a scramjet is a supersonic combustion ramjet. And so the fourth thing, the last thing to really cover on the topic of propulsion are rockets. So a rocket produces thrust by ejecting stored matter and also a change in pressure. Uh, they can be classified by liquid, solid, or electric. Uh, mostly liquid and solid is what you're familiar with. Electric engines are used uh, in, in in the vacuum of space. Um, one thing that's that's a little bit different here is what I call launch vehicles. If you look at the PLTW slides, it's a little bit confusing. So the term or the word rockets is often used interchangeably. So it can mean the rocket engine itself. Uh, some people say rocket motor, uh, but it can also mean a launch vehicle. So a launch vehicle would be like the space shuttle or uh, the Saturn V that sent the Apollo astronauts to the moon. Um, and you can look at those in a number of different ways as well. So there's expendable uh, or reusable. For example, uh, SpaceX has reusable rockets. The solid rocket boosters for the space shuttle were also reusable. Um, you can talk about the number of stages. There are multiple stages, the kind and size of the payload, and if it's manned or unmanned. So let's take a look at a liquid rocket, and they all kind of work the same way. Uh, I'm just going to kind of ignore these bullets uh, up here for now. But in a liquid rocket, you have uh, a fuel uh, and an oxidizer. They are they can be different. Um, it's common to have hydrogen for a fuel and oxygen for an oxidizer. Um, they mix in the combustion chamber here. Uh, and some of the terminology that you need to, to know uh, are things like combustion chamber, throat, that's where things converge. That's the smallest area, and we'll learn a little bit about that in an upcoming slide, the smallest area in the rocket engine itself, and then the nozzle where all the gases are expelled. Um, so this is the exit, and you can see we associate some some things with the exit. So there's the area, the velocity, the pressure at the exit, and then P sub zero is the, the free stream pressure. A solid rocket motor or solid fuel rocket, uh, it does the same thing. It ejects uh, hot gas in a uh, very fast manner, uh, but it burns um, a mixture here, and a mixture totally depends on um, the mission. For example, the solid rocket motors for the space shuttle um, use just a lot different mixture than what we will use. We're going to use some Estes motors. You can change uh, what this mixture is. You can change the shape of the uh, the cross-sectional area, and that's going to change the thrust. So it starts burning down here towards the combustion chamber. This whole thing is really a combustion chamber, but it starts burning near the nozzle typically, and will go from, as our screen goes, from right to left. Uh, once you start burning this, uh, a solid rocket motor, you cannot stop it. Unlike a liquid motor, um, you can turn off the fuel, you can turn off the oxidizer, um, you can control that. A solid rocket motor, you cannot, and that's one big difference to know. 
Here's some real, a really scary looking slide. I know. Uh, what I really want you to pay attention to is down at the bottom, uh, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, just some definitions um, and some some terminology. Here shows you know the basic uh, bell shape of a rocket engine. So here we have the combustion chamber up top, uh, the, and there are pressures and temperatures associated with almost everything in propulsion. So in the combustion chamber, uh, we call those total pressure and total temperature. Um, a star, and that's how you say it, A star is the area of the throat. Uh, we don't really talk about the area of the combustion chamber. We characterize that by temperatures and pressures. And then finally you can see the, the nozzle, and it expands. It's bigger, the area gets bigger, because right at the throat, you want flow to be super or not supersonic you want it to be sonic you want the Mach number here and that's how they're designed to be uh, one what happens is when the Mach number reaches one here if we remember the Bernoulli equations uh, we would expect the flow to slow down for subsonic flow what happens is though in a rocket engine and the reason you have this bell shaped nozzle is once it reaches sonic conditions here, it, things flip. So it actually becomes faster, and, ex, and it gets the, the Mach number here at the exit is greater than 1. That's what you want in your rocket engine. So uh, we define some terms here at the exit. You can see temperature, velocity, Mach number pressure, and so on. Um, so it gives you some other definitions up here. We can look at mass flow rate, um, and it's really defined by the area of the throat, um, some combustion chamber temperatures and pressures, um, and then the gas constant and specific heat ratios. You might remember that from chemistry. That's totally dependent on the, the fuel and the oxidizer. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of these equations. I don't expect you to know all these equations or even how they were derived. Uh, that's something that you'll get to in college. But let's take a look at the thrust equation. Um, it has a couple of different terms. So let's go to the next slide and take a little closer look. So the two terms uh, kind of look should look familiar to you. The first term is uh, relating to the mass that's ejected. So it's not uncommon for a rocket, especially a large rocket, to lose 90% of its mass uh, during launch. That's not going to happen in the rockets that we're going to launch, although they will lose mass because they burn fuel. And then the second part has to do with gas expansion through the nozzle. So if we take a look at that first term, uh, m dot v. If we remember m dot, uh, and if you want to take a look down here at the bottom, it, it kind of explains that. It's really a change in momentum is what this term is all about. So if we take m dot, and we remember that that is mass per time, and we just move the, the time underneath the v, velocity over time is really acceleration. So we have force equals mass times acceleration, Newton's second law. So that has to do, that term has to do strictly with the mass that's being ejected. We have a, we get a force from that. And then the second term has to do with pressure differences. So remember P naught or P zero is the free stream condition. So it's, it's the condition out here, whether it be the vacuum of space, in which case P naught would be close to zero or close enough to be zero where we could ignore it. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case on the surface of the Earth when you're launching a large rocket. So let's take a look at um, the units for pressure. Remember the units for pressure are a force per area, force per unit area. So if we take a force per area and we multiply it by an area, we get a force. So it's really just the exit pressure minus the atmospheric pressure times the area of the exit. When we add those two things together, that's how we get the total rocket thrust. A couple more terms that you need to know and understand. So, so let's start with the rocket thrust 
equation that we just talked about. Um, if we divide both terms by m dot, we can we end up with velocity. So uh, there's the exit velocity, and then there's another velocity we would associate with the pressure difference. And we call those two velocities when we add them up the equivalent velocity. Um, I'm not going to make you calculate um, anything with respect to equivalent velocity. Maybe there might be a, a quiz someday on it, but not right now. One thing, two things, I should say, rather, that I want you to understand. Uh, one is impulse. So impulse is a force times a time. Um, and it gives you some a derivation over here using integration and some calculus. Um, I know some of you aren't in calculus. Some of you are in Calc 3. I don't expect you to, to know that. If you know Calc and you're comfortable with it and you understand this, great. What I want you to understand is that impulse is a force times a time. Um, that's something that we really need to look at and understand in terms of rocket performance. Um, specific impulse is basically taking the total impulse and dividing by the weight uh, and it, it's called ISP for uh, that's a, supposed to be a subscript there specific it's called specific impulse um, and that is really mostly related to the propellant and it is a standard measure in industry of efficiency so some common values would be two or three hundred and the units which are really important here are seconds what are the units for total impulse well force would be pounds or newtons times seconds so it's usually pound seconds or newton seconds for impulse uh, we're going to be working with some smaller model rocket engines so we're going to use newton seconds but make sure that you know total impulse and specific impulse. So let's take a look at um, this is what a, a typical thrust curve it's called uh, looks like for a model rocket like an Estes rocket and we'll take a closer look at that on some upcoming slides as well. Uh, but the total impulse is the area under the curve so this red line is basically a map or it's a graph of the thrust of that engine mapped over time the area under that curve is the total impulse that's something you need to know we're going to work with some uh, thrust curves so you'll need to know that you're not going to have to do any integration logger pro will do it for you Uh, model rocket flight stages, uh, we're actually going to come back to this. Um, I left this slide in just so you can see kind of what's coming up. Uh, but you should know that uh, what each stage is. So when, when we launch, this is the powered uh, part of the flight. So this is when the rocket engine is on, when it's thrusting. Um, it's going to coast after the engine cuts off. Um, it's going to eject a charge and then come down. So this is what uh, a cross section of a model rocket engine looks like. It's a solid propellant, uh, just like you can see here. So if we cut it in half and took a look at it, this is what it would look like. Um, so it has down at the bottom, and I'm not going to move my uh, cursor a little bit. Down at the bottom, you see the nozzle, um, and it expands just like we would expect. Um, it has a solid propellant, um, and then it has a delay in it. And then at the top here... Um, it has a little explosive charge, so that that is a propellant, but instead of blowing down or out, it actually blows up. So what happens is when the the flame reaches or the temperature when this burns through and this part burns, it ejects the um, the parachute. So here's just a, a demonstration, if you will, of what that looks like. Uh, and real quickly, here's sort of the decoder ring, secret decoder ring, to look at different types of model rocket engines. Um, I'm not going to direct you here. I'm going to talk about this uh, in the future. But for now, just know that uh, there's a code associated with total impulse. So any letter that you go farther in the alphabet, it is higher than the previous one. So B has more total impulse than A. Uh, 
C has more total impulse than B, and usually that impulse doubles. So um, here you can see B has a range of 2.51 to 5. Um, and we're going to find from Estes that it's 5. C would be 10, and so on. So the next number indicates the average thrust, and then the delay time goes back to the previous slide. That's how much time it's going to take from when the propellant stops burning, and it's going to continue to burn through here for four seconds, and then that charge is going to come out. That's what the four means here. Um, here's, uh, I will provide this to you, so I'm not going to really talk about it. Here's uh, an actual thrust curve, it's called, from uh, Estes. I'm not sure which engine this is. It's got a max thrust of 13, so this looks like uh, it might be a B, maybe a C engine. Uh, but it'll give you the max thrust um, and where the propeller burns out. This delay period here um, is it's still burning. Uh, but here's where the ejection charge comes out. So we're going to take a look at some of those and, and analyze those in an upcoming assignment. Um, and then again, just another look. And I put this in here for a comparison so you could see what an A size motor looks like, uh, a B and a C motor looks like. So one interesting thing is here, the B6 motor has a higher thrust than a D. But one thing also to notice is that the D thrust curve and the area under that, the impulse, is much more.